as a concept, rallying is almost as old as the automobile itself, but for a long time only the rich and powerful were able to take their cars out onto the gravel tracks and dirt roads. Over time however, it became more and more popular and furthered itself into the public eye. Cars like the Mini Cooper and the Alpine A110 define that early era of rallying as something more than just a hobby. Over time, cars became faster and lighter and the routes became more demanding and competitive, and many would come to call this the golden era of rallying. In 1973, the Fédération Internationale de l'Automobile, the FIA, saw the growing popularity of rally sport and decided to create the World Rally Championship, the WRC. Classes emerged in this newfound competition, such as Group 4, which has spawned many of the greatest rally cars ever made, such as the Ford Escort RS 1800, the Fiat 131 Arbath, and the specially produced Lancia Stratos, which went on to give Lancia the win three years in a row. Group 4 became fairly successful over time, but many considered it to be held back by a number of rules and regulations, such as weight limitations, power limitations, and the need for 500 cars to be produced before homologation, though this was later lowered to 400. As time went on however, rules were altered to allow more flexibility, such as allowing four-wheel drive to power the cars, which led to the rise of the legendary Audi Quattro in 1980, but even then, those in charge still felt this wasn't enough. They wanted to remove as much as they could from the rulebook, and to achieve this, a complete rework of the WRC was necessary. Scrapping all previous categories, three new ones emerged from the ashes, Group A, Group B and Group C, as well as Group N at a later date. Group A was to replace Group 2 as the touring car class, and required 2,500 models of a car to be produced before it could be homologated, and Group A remains the last of its brethren, still used as the basis for most rally championships around the world today. Group C lasted until the mid-90s and aimed at replacing both Group 5 and Group 6, to be known as the sports car racing class, with many of its races exceeding the 250mph barrier towards its end. Group N was the runt of the squad, to replace Group 1 and known as the showroom class, having cars that were minimally modified, hence its name. But Group B was the most exciting, and sadly short-lived, of them all. Designed to replace the legendary Group 4 category, only 200 cars were required for homologation, and only had to be two-seaters. Even better, manufacturers could introduce an Evolution model each year, and only 20 instances of this new model were required for homologation. But grouping wasn't going to be that straightforward. Four internal classes were introduced to further separate the competition. The 2000cc class, the 2500cc class, the 3000cc class and the 4000cc class. Although every class had notable races, the 3000cc class was the most popular, being full of some of the most recognisable races of the period. Manufacturers now had immense freedom to build some rallying monsters, and so the race began. Notable early cars of Group B were the Audi Quattro, whose success in Group 4 pushed Audi to change almost nothing, but its grippy four-wheel drive and powerful engine meant it was still competitive. On the other hand, the Lancia Row 37 seemed like a strange introduction, still sporting rear-wheel drive. While it was great on tarmac, when it met gravel or icy surfaces it could slide about uncontrollably. Still, it won Lancia the title multiple times and is still regarded as one of Group B's finest. The first couple of years of Group B were relatively tame however. Because there wasn't a solid guarantee that Group B's rules and regulations were set in stone, or even if Group B would last into the foreseeable future, the first year of Group B was raced almost entirely with non-modified rear-wheel drive Group 4 cars. The manufacturers didn't realise the immense possibilities at this point in time, there were unbelievably only four notable rules in force, the first of which was the fact that the car had to fit two seats side by side and could not be open top. Secondly, weight limitations were to be calculated by engine displacement, thirdly, tyre width was to be calculated by engine displacement, and finally, minimum safety regulations had to be met. Cars at this point only produced around 200 to 300 brake horsepower, but it wasn't all doom and gloom at this point. The routes they raced were unchained and unseen at this point in time. The courses were notably challenging. One minute you'd be twisting and turning through the back streets of the town, and then the next you'd be gliding over the gravel with branches scratching your wind mirror. 
The 1983 season saw some changes. Now, legitimate Group B cars were being homologated, such as the Toyota Celica TCT and the Opel Manta B400, although these additions were still only upgraded counterparts to Group 4 racers. The main form of upgrade was the replacement of traditional materials with lightweight alternatives instead. 1984, on the other hand, was truly the beginning of Group B as we know and love. Two notable cars were introduced in this season, first of which was the Audi Sport Quattro, which is essentially Audi's proper introduction to Group B, now producing 450 brake horsepower, but many thought that the aging Quattro design was being pushed beyond its limits, especially when compared to its newest rival, the Peugeot 205 T16, a 350 brake horsepower beast of a car. This was mainly because the T16 was the first Group B car notable for being purposefully built. It had never been seen before Group B. Eventually, the T16 replaced the Quattro as Group B's frontrunner, setting a benchmark for all future entries into the class. But Group B did produce some flops too, it wasn't all sunshine and roses, such as the poorly received Citroen BX4 TC, which weighed a hefty 1,150 kilograms, much more than the class minimum of 960 kilograms. Still, the race really was on. 1985 and 1986 introduced some of the greatest rally cars the world ever saw. It began with both Peugeot and Audi powering up their representatives, the T16 E2 boosted the original beyond what anyone could have thought, and Audi drastically altered the Quattro into the S1 E2, not only capable of producing a monumental 600 brake horsepower, but iconic aerodynamic improvements were added too. The once successful O37 was becoming obsolete. While rear wheel drive worked in the lower power ranges, it was losing the battle that was staged between the four wheel drive monsters. So, in retaliation, the Lancia Delta S4 was launched, capable of producing 450 brake horsepower. It was immediately successful and managed to bring Lancia back into the reach of the podium. The Metro MG6 R4, while not anything special on the inside, spotted a completely unique compacted box shape, but the naturally aspirated engine was criticised by many, but it was still fairly successful. Ford made a return after years of absence with their specially built RS200, a 450 brake horsepower beast, however, many thought that the purpose built car didn't quite fill its potential and that Ford could have gone further with its design, but it still remained as one of the most promising induced by the class. By this point, engine displacements were well into supercar territory and were capable of destruction, so good drivers were required to tame these beasts, and Group B produced some of the finest drivers the world ever saw. Walter Rohl, Michel Mouton and Stig Blomqvist were some of the names that brought Group B alive, and considering that technology and safety were minimal in these races, it truly was an incredible achievement. Not only that, but the cars were notably unreliable, and put them on an extremely long dirt course and now the drivers had the added challenge of simply keeping them going. But even these experienced drivers began to notice how Group B was becoming less about skill and more about luck. Cars were becoming so powerful and unpredictable that the brain physically couldn't keep up with what was happening. It was only a matter of time before accidents began to happen. The 1986 season was set to be an exciting one, but almost immediately it was placed in jeopardy. The first incident was on May 2nd, when Antio Bottega, piloting a Lancia Row 37 on Zerubia, lost control of the car on a tight right hand corner and flew into a tree, dying on impact, and the roof itself was torn from the car. This was quickly followed by the veteran race of Vertanen flipping his T16 end over front after going over a jump. Though he did not die, his life-threatening injuries meant that this was the last time competing in Group B, never mind rallying as a whole. By this time, a lot of drivers were wanting out, in fear of an accident themselves, citing the uncontrollability of the cars. The 1986 Portugal rally proved, however, that it wasn't just the drivers in danger, but the spectators too. Since its inception, Group B's main problem in terms of safety was the spectators. At this point in time, the sport was immensely popular, and so there could be in excess of 100,000 people lining the course, most of the time with no barriers or protection. 
Add to that the fact that it was for some reason popular to try and touch the car as it flew by, or even to place obstacles in the road, and suddenly Group B transforms from a fun spectator event into something that was guaranteed to go wrong. And it came to a head when on March 5th, 1986, Joaquim Santos lost control of his RS200 and spun into a wall of spectators after cresting a jump. The incident injured 31 and killed 3 people. The safety of Group B was now being seriously questioned, and the sport was immediately postponed, when the driver collectively signed a letter insisting that it was the spectators that caused the accidents as well as the cars. But this didn't sway the president of FISA, Jean-Marie Balestre, who commended the officials for continuing the event and made no mention of the grave accident that took place earlier that day. The nail in the coffin, however, sadly arrived just a few weeks later, when the driver Henry Toivonen and his co-driver Sergio Cresto would perish in their Lancia Delta S4. Henry Toivonen was notable for pushing himself and his car to the limit. While veterans like Walter Rawl and Stig Blomqvist knew that they couldn't go at full pace because it would just be far too dangerous, and it would spell almost certain death. Toivonen was much younger and less experienced, and didn't completely realise the danger. The accident took place on the Corte Taverna stage, where the car rounded a left-hand turn, lost control and flew off the track, down a steep embankment and into a tree. The fuel tank had ruptured on the way down, and a hot mechanical element had ignited it, producing the huge plume of smoke and flames that could be seen from miles away. Toivonen and Cresto would have burned alive while still strapped in their seats, made even worse by the S4's specially designed floor, putting the fuel tank under their seats. Unlike the Portuguese officials, the Corsican officials stopped the race immediately, although they didn't get to the wreckage site until half an hour after the impact. However, when they pulled the twisted skeleton of metal away from the tree, it was clear that there would have been nothing that they could have done. The crash forced the organisers of Group B to immediately axe the championship. Not only was the name tainted forever, but it was simply impossible to run safely at its current standards. Jean-Marie Balestre supposedly stated that things can't go on like this, and Group B has to stop. The championship's proposed successor, Group S, which would have debuted in 1988, was also terminated on the spot. This was a huge blow to all manufacturers taking part, who spent months developing prototypes for the new class such as the Audi Sport Quattro RS002, the Ford RS200S, and the Mazda RX7S. While negotiations did take place between the manufacturers and FISA, they were ultimately dashed, as just a few weeks later, on the Rally Hessen, driver Mark Schurer flew into a tree in his RS200, killing his co-driver Michael Vider instantly. Schurer remained in a coma for three weeks. It was fair to say that the golden era of rallying, as many fans dubbed it, was over. In just a few short years, the competition had risen from the ashes of its predecessor with not too much to identify itself with, but quickly produced some of the greatest cars, drivers and courses the world of rallying ever saw. While Group B is long in the past, the cars the competition birthed remain some of the most exciting and dangerous machines ever built, and the drivers are hailed as gods by some rallying enthusiasts.